I'm employed by the Austrian military as a sports person. So I can follow my instincts and I can, uh, yeah, do what I feel at this moment. And if you're like packed full with information, like what kind of targeted training you did for, uh, for, for world champs. I think the hardest part from, or I, I think it was very hard coming into the senior years, uh, to set goals for yourself. Welcome everybody to the channel. Today I'm talking with Yanis Bonek, who has had some extremely interesting performances this year. And he's also been quite an um, entitled competitor during the previous years, during his junior career. And now he's shining also in the elite class. So I didn't hesitate asking him to join us for a chat. And I think this is going to be a very interesting to learn how uh, what was his journey throughout his senior years, leaving the junior career, and how much effort, time, and maybe targeted training uh, were necessary to get him to the place where he's actually able to fight for the medals in the uh, most demanding uh, men elite class, getting the medal this year on the middle distance during the World Orienteering Champs. Amazing. And then topping it off with winning the World Cup in the middle distance as well in Czech Republic. So, Yanis, welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for it. Yeah, so we, we've, we've already had a, a short chat regarding your beginning years, and how you started your career and how you went uh, from um, an athlete that was really good physically and you were able to compete on that absolutely highest level on uh, on inside austria on, on your on the national level right and then you were able also to get some good races during eoc and jaywalk uh, with um, medals um, during your competition in relay and in individual performance as well then you went into your senior class how did you feel uh, or how did you how do you remember this step from you know going from jaywalk to competing in world orienteering champs were you were you already able to go to world orienteering champs as a junior because that happens sometimes no i have not been at world champs as okay. a junior no and then when you went to the elite class during your first year did you uh, did you qualify from from austria to to represent yeah, the well, country my first year was uh, covid year 2020 so there right. wasn't, were no competitions but i managed to go to the world champs the year after in 2021 in right. and that republic. was in czech republic again right because yes. that was the yeah. replaced competition for from i think it, it was supposed to be somewhere else wasn't it no i think it was supposed to be czech republic but they just added the sprint competitions ah yes maybe that was it that was it so how do you, how do you remember that and how how did you do over there? Yeah, I I remember I think the hardest part from or I I think it was very hard coming into the senior years uh, to set goals for yourself because yeah it was quite natural in in youth and junior years you you wanted to be like with the best and you wanted to be fighting for medals and uh, yeah coming to the seniors. You were thinking, okay, what's realistic? How, <laughs> how how far can you go? Um, do I set my goal top thirty? Is that something like I really want, or does it matter if I'm thirty or forty? I don't, so that that was really something I thought was pretty hard, like uh -huh. in the beginning, to to really define. And That's how did you goal. how how did you approach this? Yeah, actually, because I was coming like out of the period with injuries in 2019, 2020, I I then really just tried to focus on on my training and uh, getting like consistent, getting healthy, and not thinking too much about result goals. And uh, I think that was. Uh, that worked pretty well in that year because yeah we could see the improvements and uh, so it was like let's feel it down you know let's let's do what i can let's uh, get into the right shape 
go into qualify, go into the, the competition and see where I'm at, see how I do. Yeah. So that, that's that's probably, you know, I'm thinking that it, it, it even might be helpful, you know, because that basically says that there is no pressure with your results. You just go there and you're, you know, whatever happens, happens. You just want to do your best and uh, whichever result that will yield, you'll just take it and be happy with it. Kind of, yeah. Yeah, so it's like different from the competitions you were we were talking about earlier when you were going to EOG or J1 and you were like, okay, I want to perform. I want, I have some goals. I, I want to achieve mm -hmm. something. And then going to uh, World Champs, you're like, okay, let's just take it easy and see where I'm at, uh, where I'm at, so that I get some reference maybe for the next year. Exactly. Yeah, that's what I did. But that was also like the not that easy at the World Champs because if you're if you're running a long distance in Czech Republic and it's getting really tough and sometimes I think you need a goal in your back of your head to know what you're fighting for and uh, so I think there was a bit of a downside that I was running these competitions and kind of yeah, not knowing <laughs> why I'm suffering or for <laughs> what I'm suffering <laughs> so and, like what you're saying is that you know if you had the goal in your head maybe it would allow you or free you to push yourself a little bit harder yeah for example yeah okay um how do you prepare for for these competitions in general and, and i don't mean only you know the uh the world champs because obviously this is the most important competition for you probably i'm guessing um but you also have some other important starts throughout the year so i know that for example last year you won the Tumila with your club, haven't you? Right? Yes. That's yeah. another awesome achievement. Uh, so Tumila is definitely an important race for you as well. Um, you might be starting it at Yukola, I don't know. I haven't been there yet. No. no. So no Yukola. But um, World Cup races, right? So there are several of them during the year. Is there any special preparation you do to perform during those competitions? Yeah, I mean, the... I guess the most important preparation is always like training camps on the places where where the competitions will be. But if it's a like tight uh, competition calendar, it's not always that easy to to fit in training camps for each of these competitions. You yeah you have to choose like which competitions you really want to aim to, and sometimes like Timila last year, I I traveled there earlier like five days ahead to get a bit of Swedish terrain again in for uh, before the Tumila and, and some night training but um, yeah so I, I would say it always depends a bit on what's the competition where it is um, how how much ref effort you put into the preparation and how yeah how much time you invest Okay, but basically you are mostly preparing for those competitions technically, like so to getting the feeling of the terrain that you're going to be running through. That's that's the main goal. Yes, I mean the physical preparation is going there all year round. Right, so it's ongoing. Right, it's ongoing, and yeah, the most important is maybe to yeah have a consistent in the consistency in your physical training so um yeah the preparation system really the the special preparations in the train i would say yeah right okay so let's let's leave then the technical preparation for now and let's talk a little bit about physical preparation so uh you you've mentioned that even in your early junior years you already had an opportunity to train two times a day, maybe not every day, but some days, right? Um, how much training do you, do you do now? Is it still like you're sticking to two trainings per day? Yes, mostly. Mostly it's uh, two trainings a day, one rest day a week, actually. So six days of training per week. And those days, mostly twice a day, yeah. Yeah. So you said one rest day, not race yes. day. Rest day, <laughs> okay. yes. All right, okay. Just wanted to make sure. Um, and how many of these sessions are done with the map? 
when I'm at home, more like zero. Okay. Um, and when I'm on training camp, it could be like all of the sessions or maybe sure. not all, but right. you go to many. the forest training camp, for example, and you run almost all of the session. With the exactly. So, so yeah, I, I didn't ask this, but which part of Austria do you live, live in and what are the terrains around you? Is it like uh, hilly, nice or interesting terrains or, or not really? In Vienna. So it's hilly, but it's not very like technically detailed. It's just like more or less the slopes and some hills and you basically know all the maps already which are in close yeah. proximity and i know this problem <laughs> uh, yeah, not the most fun like terrains to like go out right. and do or cheering session every day it's not demanding and challenging anymore right it's it's hard to have a good orienteering session yeah well would, impossible because you can always do something with the map but all in all, you you know the maps and terrains pretty well already, even mm. by sight. All right. Um. So. Yeah. The, the 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 other thing I'm immediately thinking of is that okay, you're running two times a day, you're participating in lots of competitions plus training camps, preparing you for the competitions. So. You're a pro athlete, like like you're a full time athlete, aren't you? Yes. So. I'm employed by the Austrian military as a sports person. So we we get paid to train and compete. Yeah, to be like as professional as possible. So that's yeah, it's really the focus. I mean, I'm studying part time on the side, but mm -hmm. they have been neglected a bit in the past half year, I would say. Okay, okay. Well, um. I'm very happy that you have this opportunity, you know, because, you know, when I was talking about the scales and comparing volleyball and, and orienteering, this is a problem, you know, in our sport, that the popularity of orienteering is not there yet. Therefore, uh, it's not that easy to get sponsorships or um, high paid contracts that allow you to, you know, be a full time athlete. Therefore, those countries that have the opportunity to run as military teams, and Poland is one of them as well. I think um, this this opens up some paths for you, you know, so that you actually get some money and you can focus on what you want to be doing, you know, on, on your training and the regime. So good, good, good that you have this opportunity. Opportunity. Um, how does your like if you would break your year? into some main phases throughout do you have like a preparation period and then you know speeding up maybe period then maybe competition period yeah i would say that the year is basically depending a bit on the competitions and when the competitions are you want to perform but mm -hmm. i think in winter is Made basically just training and then in spring the first competition start and you use those competitions to like more or less as a training to to get on a high level towards like the world champs which are in summer which are always the big goal i would say so those are the phases where you have like a general preparation period in winter and then it's more specific in starting from April, I don't know, April, May, June, and then July's competition period or time to race. And yeah, then yeah. then in fall, there's or mostly again some competitions. And then after, after those, it's time to rest a bit and then start again. Yeah. Okay. So pretty standard. Uh, yeah. Who writes your training plan? Uh, my coach is Vincent van Meulen. He is okay. a physio therapist, actually, but he coaches um, several athletes. I mean, he he's, he he doesn't have an orienteering background, so it's just like physical training. Actually, we're doing together. Okay. Um, well, shout out to the coach because it seems like you're both doing a great job with your training plan, and uh, you know putting it into action. Uh, but I, I asked this question because I was, I was wondering if maybe it's one of your parents. <laughs> <laughs> no, 
No, my my mother was or when I was uh, young, first my granddad was kind of coaching me, and then then my mother was coaching me like into junior years. But then actually, when I had my injury in twenty nineteen, I I was looking for or someone who also has like experience in alternative training and cycling because I yeah had to do a lot of that yeah and that's how I found my coach and yeah I'm very lucky to have him I would say cool cool congrats your story actually just reminded me that you know you, you talking about your grandfather how you started with him and uh, he, he was helping you get your first put your first steps into orienteering it reminded me of the Casper Fosser story he kind of he kind of said the, the, the very similar thing so that's a very nice to hear um and uh what was on my mind next um yeah your training plans are, are they available for um, other people to uh look at for example on strava or, or garmin or somewhere mm, no i i have my strava private because ah. I, yeah, uh, no, <laughs> it's not, it's not that it's uh, something special, but I, uh, I, I don't need to. I don't think I, I'm not doing the training to impress others to put it on Strava. So I, I don't care. Uh, yeah, that's why. You I know, don't at this to. point in time, it it might not be about impressing others. It might be to just allow others to take a look at what you're actually doing. Because yeah. people will be interested. If it, but you, you if know, it's, I'm, I'm of course not pushing. You can do whatever. Yeah, you want. I'm, I'm just saying that your way of thinking might not be accurate anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, maybe in some point of time, but uh, I don't think it's too interesting, actually. All right. Um. So, yeah, since we are talking about this, um. I, I googled a, a little bit around the internet and I saw that, for example, last year you have a you you've had a 10k race with 31, 45, I think, somewhere in the first half of the year. Do you think you're faster this year? Yes, I would hope so. Okay, so uh, because I, I was just you know kind of trying to gauge how fast, more or less, you have to be to be able to fight or contest the medals um at the at the elite class so what would you say your time for 10k would be right now like, like uh, around 31 minutes low hard maybe to say, probably i it's it's really hard to say because coming into world champs now i've basically not or i've not been training on flat asphalt so, so you, you've been doing probably lots of climbs as well right climbing and terrain running and so I actually don't have like that much like knowledge now how how fast I could be, but yeah, it happens a lot to our interiors. I have to say, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> they very rarely get on track. And like, okay, let's see my time for five k, ten k, three k, whatever. Right. Mm. <laughs> All right. So, um, your progress from last year to this year has been very visible i would say right and, you know probably another good word would be amazing because you were able to climb from um the places of 20th 30th uh, you know 40th in uh, national level orienteering to a place where you're now contesting the very very best in orienteering this year what would you say contributed to for, for you to 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 making you know this big step forward since you know from last year to this year yeah i think it's there are several factors um i would why, say so probably why it's like that um so first of all i mean i've been training now for past few years like consistently and uh, improving or trying to improve like just step by step and then I really made like a effort towards world champs this year, um, with extra, extra training camps and extra focus and really put that on the highest list. And then actually I would say last year I was pretty unlucky 
Um, so my results from last year, or actually I felt already last year, I, I could have been better than the results show. So that's maybe also contributing why it uh, looks like a bigger step to this year than, than it maybe has been like from what I, I see, see. but, uh -huh. but I definitely made like over the winter, uh, another step towards uh yeah towards the top just also like physically improving for training and uh yeah so that's how i would explain it yeah all right so basically you're saying that already last year you you were pretty good and maybe some mistakes that just um disrupted the the results that we can see on the internet and you could have placed a little bit better but that also tells me that maybe you got better technically you know year to year um because this year you maybe are able to avoid those mistakes and have those cleaner races at the same time so we will get to this part um you also say that um because you have been uh, able to train consistently your form is getting better year by year so thanks to this, you are a little bit stronger this year compared to last year, right? So that's understandable. And then uh, some uh, some more effort have been put to prepare yourself for the World or Orienteering Champs in Czech Republic this year. Uh, so let's stop at this one and talk a little bit about what kind of targeted training you did for uh, for for World Champs. So what was what was the main idea? about it like was it like i i want to be able to because I, I feel like there are probably three aspects to this right so one is you know i just want to be able to be strong in the terrain on the hills for example that are going to wait for me both middle distance and long distance long distance even more right and then uh, i want to be able to run as smooth as possible through the harsh terrain like undergrowth and uh, uh, uneven ground that um, the, the Czech, Czech, Czech terrains uh, have. Although this year is maybe not that bad in terms of runnability, I think the worst part maybe was the you know slope running along along the slope. I don't know. You tell me. Um, and. Sorry, no, it was it was in Czech Republic this year, right? Uh, it was World Cup. I'm, I'm I'm confusing these ones. Yeah, sorry about that. And then um, the the last thing is preparing technically, you know, for the terrain and and the, the, the right kind of navigation for Switzerland, right? That's what we are talking about. So, did you like tackle all of those three, or you you felt like okay, it's some uh, like maybe maybe my um, climb uh, or strength is good enough to climb those hills and i don't have to focus on this one uh, so i'll focus on something else instead no we um so our idea was to improve physically because we thought that, okay this is in the end really decisive and what was maybe the most important we also said we prepare for the altitude in switzerland so I made three altitude camps in preparation for walk. So that was probably the biggest change in into this year. And yeah, a lot of focus putting on that. And yeah, technically I also put more effort into it than I, I maybe like have done previously, being more time in Switzerland, preparing more on uh relevant maps and terrains so i think it was a was a combination of of everything but um yeah coming in the winter focusing on the physical development and then coming towards the competition really um being as much as possible in switzerland and trying to have trainings in similar trains and yeah yeah um where did you have the, your high altitude training camps were they in switzerland as well no in winter i was in south africa uh, twice uh -huh. and then in june i was in livigno in italy ahead of world champs yeah 
So in Lavinia, you were probably able to do some more engineering training there. I think, yeah. I think there one are some maps. Training. I did one training uh, uh, there. There because there, there are some new maps there. But then I actually got sick on the altitude camp, so I there was not that much training okay. for the rest of the camp. All right, I see. Um and uh in terms of like again technical preparation, what do you feel was the most demanding part to prepare technically from the for, for the terrains that were in Switzerland this year? I think most demanding was the slope running for the long distance and uh, this attacking uh, controls on the slopes and to know how, how high you are or how how far down you have to go if there are not that many objects to yeah to earn tier in between the controls so that that was really a challenge i felt to to really learn that and then of course the uh, middle distance terrain was really special or really detailed and the Cresta say map for example and just the side of what did I mean uh, I think it's horrible there to be honest uh, so yeah really demanding to to be able to read the map and understand what's on the map and to uh, navigate th through yeah this um, forest where it's up and down and rocks and everything in between and yeah you yeah you can't see far and so that was uh, a main challenge i would say yeah and uh, so i'll step back and then i will come back to this one because that's also interesting so for this slope running you know um so you're basically saying that one of the challenges was to uh, get your skills of following the contour on a little bit higher level, so follow, running on the same level, right? Um, what kind of training sessions prepare you for this? Just you know, running and thinking, okay, I need to keep the level here and let's see uh, if I'm able to do this. Or did you have any targeted training sessions to for, for this skill in particular? Yeah, well, it's... I would say it was not only like to run on the on the same level on the same height but also to know if you have to go like 50 meters down like on a like yeah diagonal yeah um well we just did it by training on 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 maps which were similar we had some some one camp in austria as well where we had the long distance training where we yeah, just had some longer legs through the slopes and where you had to like know okay how how far you still have to go up or down and it was mainly with normal orienteering I would say we did okay. prepare for that yeah okay and now for the middle distance uh you're right the terrain was pretty tricky over there I mean I haven't seen the terrain per se I just looked at the map following the world orienteering champs and it felt like uh, the terrain wall had like lots of features, but those features were quite similar to one another. So if you lost track of where you currently are, it, it was probably pretty hard to get back on the map, you know, and find yourself uh, running with confidence again. Was it your experience as well? And you're like thinking what's ahead of you before the world champs? Yeah, for sure. That was was a very tricky part. Okay. So but what, it was what was the strategy then to tackle this the strategy was to not stress myself and not push because in the trainings beforehand i really felt i can't i don't have the speed in this kind of terrain i i can't read the map fast enough and so yeah when i was preparing for this middle distance i was uh, the week before the world champs i was there with my brother and we were di discussing a bit about the tactics and i i just said i don't see a, a reason to like to gamble and to push harder and um, so the tactics should be just to go in the speed you can you can navigate well and that's what i did in the end and 
worked out quite okay, I would say. Okay. I actually want to stop over here and emphasize what you've said, because I'm hearing it quite often, you know, from the top athletes that I'm talking to. And many of them say, I mean, I haven't heard anyone so far say that, okay, I got a medal because I decided to risk it, you know, and push it beyond my limits, beyond my boundaries, beyond the threshold where I feel like I'm comfortable running with the map and it paid off, you know? But at the same time, quite a lot of especially young runners think that maybe I'm not exactly prepared to fight for the medal. Therefore, why not risk it, you know, and risk it for the biscuit, you know, push a little bit harder. And if I'm able to do this, then I'm going to maybe get into top six or top three. If not, well, so be it. I will be like 80th, right? Whatever. And I feel like this is a, a very... I mean, you probably experienced it as well at some point in time, but I feel like this is a very bad approach to risk it, you know, and you should always go like with whatever you're currently comfortable with. And of course, you should be working to get this level of uh, the uh, comfortable orienteering as high as possible. Uh, uh, but if, if you're like planning to risk it and then you have like 20 controls during the race and you know that you will be taking that risk almost at every control, there are really so many chances for something to go bad that it probably will in the end. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That's what I thought. So I, yeah, I think this, this also comes with experience that you learn, you have to stay calm and yeah, I actually accept that. Okay. Maybe I'm not fast enough to, to be in the top with, in this kind of terrain mm -hmm. and, but it's not worth it to to risk it and then make a huge mistake. So right. that, that's why I chose the, that so it's, tactic. It's, you basically said that instead of taking the risk, you, you decided that, okay, I did all of those preparations and they got me to some place and then I, I need to run at the place where I am at. And that paid yeah. off. So were you surprised with the result? What were your goals for the World Orient Team Champs? Yeah, I was surprised with the result because... Actually, I I thought I had better chances on the long distance, to be honest. Okay. And the long distance was more kind of the race where I was like mentally ready and thought, okay, this is um, where it should go well. Because like I said, I, I felt I was not like technically on that level to, to perform well on this kind of middle distance train. Right. And... Yeah, so uh, it was a surprise that that it worked out in the middle distance then, yes. What about the long distance? Were you happy with your result on the long distance too? Uh, not really, because, yeah, like I said, there I put my main focus probably, or there were where I just thought, okay, this is, this is my chance to perform well, and then I... I had a, I don't know, I didn't feel that well that day or I, I just physically didn't have that what it takes. And then I also made some like stupid decisions. So it was actually a quite disappointing day, the long distance, I would say. Um, and I, after that long distance, I, I didn't really think it would be possible like to turn it around. Um, that way on the middle distance so I actually didn't I I went into the middle distance with not that much pressure um, yeah so kind of a surprise it worked out then yes yeah I'm actually surprised how how often like people say that you know if, if they run something without as much pressure as as before some some somehow it suddenly clicks and, and gets better so like uh, if if like if you have the same kind of thinking uh, about what happened, maybe it's worth taking into account how you put pressure on yourself, what kind of goals you set up for yourself to like uh, be at the more comfortable place of the competition rather than the one where, where you're actually fighting for um, a position that maybe you're not comfortable fighting for. You know what I mean? Mm. 
Yeah. I, Even understand. from what you're saying, right? It, it seems like you did uh, did better and felt a little bit more comfortable during the races where the pressure wasn't there. And very often, you know, the pressure is coming from within ourselves, especially for ambitious runners like you're, I'm sure you are. Uh, so it's definitely something to think about. One more thing I want to ask regarding the preparations for the World Orienting Champs. So you didn't mention anything uh, regarding working on route choices, but I feel like you must have also worked a lot around this area because it probably was especially for the long distance, which you said you were preparing for um, mostly. It was, it, was, it was a very important part, right? To get the route choices right. Mm. Did you do any specific training regarding the route choices, maybe off the map, off the you know, standard running trainings, somewhere just in front of your computer? Not that much, actually. Um, I also feel like route choices are actually a, a weakness. For myself so i mean i did we we had the old maps from the long distance area and i mean we looked at the terrain and um thought about some possibilities how route choices could look like um but yeah that was uh i think it's always hard to prepare route choices or to prepare for route choices so it was not too much effort into that but maybe it also was a bit too little to be honest yeah what do, what do you think is hard to prepare for route choices why um sometimes i feel if you're preparing too much it's kind of like puts even more stress in, onto yourself and you're not uh, you can't decide that freely um, when running the competitions. And that's how I, I like to do engineering where I'm, I can follow my instincts and I can, uh, yeah, do what I feel at this moment. And if you're like packed full with information, like go, go right on this option and go left there. This, I just sometimes feel this just gets too much. Mm -hmm. So that's, why i'm yeah so i'm not too keen hmm. on doing too much of those preparations so i'm all for going with the instincts you know you should do this but only if your instincts are right right you know what i what you know what i mean and i think that in english the saying would would say um I'll probably mess it up, but like favors the prepared, right? More or less. So you'll get better results. You will get lucky more often if you actually prepare for it. Mm -hmm. And I think the same goes for the instincts. Like we, we are not born with the instincts to pick root choices. It's it's not there. You know, it's not a natural skill for humans because our evolution didn't have maps in them. <laughs> we only have maps for like, you know, several thousands of years probably, which in terms of our evolution is like nothing. So our brains are not wired to pick best route choices. And that's something we develop while doing orienteering and learning through practice, basically. But we also learn through race analysis, and we can also learn through uh, dry practice. Uh, so practicing route choices without, without actually running with the map. And I feel like Getting to the place where you have good instincts about the root choices is maybe, you know, maybe you're thinking about a little bit different of a practice that I'm thinking about because you said, okay, I, I don't want to be focused on, okay, if I, if I have this kind of root choice, go left. If I have this kind of root choice, go right. So maybe you're thinking about practices where you actually look at the old maps and you're drawing some controls, some some legs, and you're thinking, how do I, would I approach this? I'm, I'm probably more think, thinking more about, you know, practicing general choice on other maps, different maps, so that you wire your brain to be able to quickly analyze that, okay, if I go here, I will, for example, have to do additional 400 meters. 
from this side. If I go from this side, I will probably have to do like additional 50 meters of climb. Now, which one is better for me? Is it better to do 400 meters or 50 meters of climb, right? Or if I go here, I will step into some marsh area or green area or whatever, right? And I know that this in this kind of a terrain, for example, marshes are pretty fine and or the green areas are probably uh, not runnable at all, right? So I want to avoid it. So these are the instincts I'm talking about. And then if you have those instincts, sure, absolutely go with those. But I'm also pretty sure that you can get those instincts on a higher level by practicing, you know? So um, if you, you're saying that you're not doing much of that, maybe it's something to dig into. Yeah, I mean, for sure it is something to to focus more on. But I, I read I actually like go for another run than sit in front of the computer. Ah, you don't enjoy that. I see. So <laughs> maybe I'm just a bit lazy on that side. Uh, um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't know if I call it laziness. Uh, we, like, I always strongly believe that we should do the things that we enjoy in life. You know, and if you enjoy running more than doing dry practice in front of the computer and it still serves the purpose, why not do that? <laughs> All right. Um, after the World Cup, uh, sorry, World Orienteering Champs, you said that you were quite surprised with the result on the middle distance. Does it mean you were even more surprised to win the World Cup in Czech Republic? No, because Just like then... Or that it happened that day, yes, because I really was like, I was training basically nothing after work. Uh -huh. So it was, uh, yeah, I was coming into the World Cup. The middle distance was my first fast session since the World Champs. You were fresh, man. Yes, I was <laughs> fresh. And I, I mean, that I really felt fresh also. So that was a good, good thing. But yeah, I mean the the middle distance at the world champs definitely showed okay i can uh, be up there and i can fight for the top exactly and um yeah then then it happened that already at the world cup in like three weeks later i mean yeah of course it's always a surprise or it's hard to say how, how good you will run, but um, I, I think it was uh, less of a surprise than the than the world champs for me. I would say, yeah. right, because you already had that reference, and you know, okay, I'm actually able to get there. Yeah, cool. Right, I mean, it's I'm I'm super happy actually. I was super happy when I saw the results from from uh, World Cup because you know it happens sometimes that. Uh, Runners get some very good results, like medal positions during the World Orienteering Champs. But it was sometimes a stroke of luck, something just, it was just a perfect day for them, you know, and not so great for the competitions, competition or competitors. So uh, it's it's hard sometimes for runners to repeat the success. You were, you were able to replicate it like three weeks later. Uh, so it's, it, it I, I, for me, it confirms what, what what you've been saying, that even last year, you were probably uh, a little bit higher than the results show. And this year, you made this maybe not that big step forward, but a, a, another step forward to get you to uh, be able to compete with the best in the world, which is, you know, a pretty crowded place. You know, e even if, I, if you are in a top shape uh, and, and you're going to the competition with uh, all the best runners from the world i don't think that anyone is thinking okay i'm i am getting the goal you know e even casper probably is not going there and he's like i'm getting the goal there is no one that can contest me there are there are at least few few runners at the very very top level that you can easily lose to right just because mm -hmm. you have a little bit of a war stage just because you made a small mistake at the control so i'm i was very happy to see that you were able to get to that, you know, not necessarily the medal, but you know, if if you even place top six, that would be like this man knows what knows what he's doing, you know, and he's he's there consistently. And uh, the results on the long distance, both on the world or in team champs, wasn't a bad result at all. Maybe not satisfactory or perfect to you, 
but it was it was definitely an okay result as well. And then uh, during um, uh, the World Cup, can you remember the play? Remind me the place that you had now in uh, seventh on the World right. Cup. Seventh, exactly right. So another very good result. So I'm thinking that we're going to be seeing more of you in the top ten in the upcoming races in the, all, still this season and hopefully in the following seasons. So oh, yeah. that all, that always makes me happy to see you know another name and face uh, to contest uh, all the best runners in the world. And I'm very happy for you, Anis. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Okay, and, and with this, I want to thank you for joining the chat today. Uh, it was really fun to know you, to get to know you and to talk. Maybe we'll have another chance to talk somewhere in the future, maybe do some race analysis. That's always interesting for everybody. So who knows, maybe in a, in a few months, maybe after the World Cup, or in, in autumn we will be able to get again and talk a little bit more with the map in hand yeah thanks a lot for the invitation it was uh, nice talking to you thank you as well for all of you watching hope you've enjoyed uh, meeting Yanis and listening to his story if you've liked the uh, chat today consider subscribing liking and if you want to ask something uh, Yanis or me, just post a comment and we will do our best to answer those. Thank you so much.